exactly the way you would have seen this uh, uh, hospital set up. MASH, of course, stands for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. You'll see in front of it, this is our M43 ambulance. This is the most common ambulance that would have been over in Vietnam. As we keep coming through on the right-hand side, you're going to see our 1924 Premium Series 116. This vehicle was pretty much the first redesign that the Dodge Brothers did after they started building vehicles in 1914. They lowered it, stretched it, started adding automated features to their vehicles, uh, such as the windshield wipers. You'll notice as we go through this museum, a lot of Dragon Man's vehicles are played take them out uh, a lot of times especially before COVID you would put them in the military parades the veterans parade so every single one of our vehicles all 93 military vehicles are operational in this uh, museum with the exception of the M47 patent battle tank that's the tank you saw out front of the museum interesting note on the M47 the only tank the US military produced that did not see combat so as we keep coming through on the right hand side, you're going to see our Ben-Hur trailer. This trailer was made uh, quite a bit out of wood, again the military trying to conserve metal. The Ben-Hur trailer was the most produced trailer in World War II. Almost 260,000 units were produced. On the inside of our row, you're going to see our M2 half-track, our second M15 half-track, and the M3 half-track. Dragon Man has all of the half-tracks made by the U.S. military. You can have a look inside and kind of see where the driver and commander would sit, see where they would store their M1 Garand rifle, and actually the thickness of the metal uh, themselves. It wouldn't really take that much of a high-powered round to penetrate this metal. Um, when you look into the history books and look at the German half-tracks, or you might have seen the display, the model on display in the German room, when the Germans built their half-tracks, they actually cantered the sides of their vehicles. And this actually allowed for the, uh, uh, the rounds to actually uh, deflect or uh, ricochet off of the metal itself. You'll see that these half-tracks, a lot of them have rollers on the front. Anybody tell me why these half-tracks would have had rollers? No flats. Any idea? Uh, it would have helped them to cross over trenches or ditches, okay? These half-tracks can span distances of up to about six feet. When they would go through a trench or a ditch, the front tires would drop into it. The roller would actually hit the other side of the bank, and then the tracks would actually push it up and over. You'll see at this our M3 half track, a little bit bigger than the M2. You can kind of have a look in the back where they would carry up to about seven passengers. You'll see the radio in there. It is the original radio to that vehicle and operational. produced that did not get sold privately to the general public, okay? Because of its narrow wheelbase, it was prone to rollovers, so it was actually deemed unsafe for highway use. The ones that there was ex one exception where there was an, actually an auction that was sold uh, to about 1,000 people, the rest of them actually were cut in quarters or cut in half and then scrapped. Fortunately enough for the ones we have in the museum, uh, they were only cut in half, so Dragon Man was able to weld them back together, put roll cages on them, and they're operational today. As we come around the corner, you're going to see a few more uh, military vehicles, some more half tracks. Uh, you'll see a, a, another deuce and a half in the corner, a bunch of M37s. I think he's got five now. Uh, M37 was very prevalent over in Vietnam. You'll see another ABS or advanced bomb suit. And along the wall, you're going to see five thousand pound cluster bombs, okay? These cluster bombs were designed to be dropped out of the aircraft, explode about 150 to 200 feet above the enemy forces. When they would explode, they would send out thousands of pieces of shrapnel and ball bearings down below them, basically obliterating anything that uh, they hit. This vehicle has come through on the left hand side. This is our M29 Studebaker Weasel. It is a track vehicle, it is amphibious. 
Uh, it did serve time in uh, Italy along the Western Front. I uh, was there during uh, Operation Overlord as well as the invasion. The Marines used through this. Just so you know that this is not styrofoam or a, a prop. Well, drop that on my toes. I need my toes. It's got a little bit of weight to it, right? Okay. So uh, he didn't look very strong. So how about I try you? Okay. Well, drop that. It's got a little bit of weight to it, don't it? Okay. So that's what a 50 caliber round can do to an inch and a half, two inch steel plate. So again, let me get back to my story. We talked about World War II. This was used also in Korea. Well, in Korea. The uh, aircraft was getting a little bit too technical, uh, too advanced, so our guys didn't have anything to shoot at. So they again turned it into an anti-personnel vehicle. Works. Uh, all the electronics are original, okay. The T-54, most produced tank in the world. The first prototype was built in 1945, and then they started mass producing these in 1948. This tank that you're looking at actually uh, served in the Czechoslovakian army. And again, like I said, it does run. You can see pictures out front of it of Dragon Man driving it around the property. Um, and this is one of the vehicles. He's got 93 military vehicles. He's got 42 hot rods. He's got a dragster. He's got a coffin car. But he says this is the sketchiest vehicle that he's ever driven. I can only imagine. I mean, it's about 11 feet wide. You get it into the garage doors. The garage doors are only 12 feet wide. But hopefully if we have a good turtle season after, after Veterans Day, uh, hopefully he'll throw me the keys and I'll be able to take it out for a burn because I think that's going to be pretty cool. <laughs> Just so you know, those are 100 millimeter shells that the tank does fire. So the last vehicle that I'm going to talk about... And uh, the Civil War started in 1861. These are a lot of the type of uh, weapons they used. Uh, 1861, 1865, there was over 30 different gun manufacturers up north, right? And I have at least over 20 of the different manufacturers' guns uh, right here. Uh, I'm always getting more and more stuff. So when the Civil War started in 1861, the American flag only had 33 stars. That's Oregon. Uh, a year later, Kansas joined the Union, and the American flag went for 34 stars. This is the Confederate national flag with the six bulldog stars. And this is the Confederate battle flag that people call the rebel flag. So as soon as the Civil War started, the Union Army, that's the blue uniforms, they, they just blocked everything north of uh, Virginia. So the Confederate Army couldn't go up north and buy the firearms, black powder, caps, or balls. So what they did is uh, they went overseas to other countries, mostly Great Britain, and they bought Enfields. This is the most popular Enfield that the uh, Confederate Army used against the uh, Union Army, uh, 58 caliber. This is the size of the lead ball that the rifle shot. <sighs> Pretty big. This hits you in the head, your head comes off. Okay. The most popular rifle that the Union Army used is right here, Springfield Armory, and that was also 58 caliber. So if you got a hold of your enemy's ammunition, you could have vice versa, you could have used it in your rifle. Let me point out some of these uh, men here. This is uh, General Grant. Towards the end of the Civil War, he gained his uh, third star. He was our 18th president, if you didn't know that. He's on your $50 bill. This is Robert E. Lee. He was the head general for the uh, Confederate Army. And uh, April 9th, 1865, he, uh, he surrendered to Grant, okay? This guy here, Indian fighter, and uh, his name was uh, George Custard, Indian fighter. He was only 37 years old. He was in charge of the 7th Cavalry. June 25th, 1876, he got killed at Little Bighorn Indian Reservation in Montana. He had a, a little less than 700 men under him. He was supposed to go up there, scout everything out, and just wait for reinforcements. But he was the kind of general that just wanted to do things, you know, his way and make a name for himself. He got everybody but one soldier killed in less than five hours. Oh my. Yeah, the one soldier uh, he sent uh, too late though to get help. You know, he got he told the whole story. Custer's last stand. Okay, so uh, this guy here, Abraham Lincoln, he was our 16th president. That killed uh, Lincoln. I paid four thousand dollars for this. Came from another museum, and this is the forty-four caliber ball, just like the one that went in his head. April uh, fourteenth, eighteen sixty-five. He died the next day, April fifteenth. So you don't get any closer than that. The same caliber, same manufacturer, made in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
uh, same make, same model. I'm always getting more and more stuff. Okay, now I'm going to tell you about George Washington, the first president we ever had in the United States, uh, 1889. Uh, I'll show you a little history about George Washington. Okay, this is the, uh, the 13 colonists. I had that sign made last year. Okay, so uh, 1775, uh, the 13 colonists all got together and they wanted to declare their independence from the British uh, because the British were taxing them to death, right? In 1776, they declared their independence July 4th from the British and they picked George Washington to be the general and create the first army in America. America is 245 years old now, if you didn't know that. And uh, he really had a hard time uh, with the 13 colonists, all the men, tens of thousands of them. Uh, most of them were like drunks. Uh, they were farmers. Uh, they were bums. They really didn't want to be a soldier. Yeah. They used to go practice with George Washington for two or three days, and then they want to go home. You know? <laughs> that, that's what he had to put up with. So we got a hold of Benjamin Franklin. He's on my favorite bill <laughs> right here, Benjamin Franklin. He was a diplomat. He, saw, he sent Benjamin Franklin on a sailboat to France uh, to talk to the French government to see if they could get troops to come back and help George Washington fight the British, which wasn't hard to him because then the French people hated the British. If you didn't know it, it took 30 days for the sailboat to go from America to France and 30 days back. That's a long trip. So he came back with uh, like tens of thousands of uh, troops, and this is the musket that the French people used to fight the British. This is uh, 260 years old. It's called a flintlock. See that? In perfect shape. Beautiful. And it's 68 caliber. The ball's even bigger than the one I showed you. Flintlock. In fact, every gun in this cabinet is over 250 to 300 years old. Yeah, these are all flintlocks. Okay, four, four years later, 1781, uh, the British surrendered and went back to Great Britain. In 1787, the Constitution of the United States was written, signed by our founding fathers of America, and then in 1789, uh, Washington became our first president. He did two tours. That's eight years. He got out of there in 1797, and the guy who was the next president was uh, John Adams. Two years later, uh, George Washington passed away in 1799. He's the only president that never slept in the White House. The White House was finally done a year later in the year 1800. So that's a little history about George Washington. Uh, this lady in the middle here, her name is Martha. Uh, that was George Washington's uh, wife. And she looks a little rough because 245 years ago, there was no beauty polish. <laughs> but she's not that bad. I'd go out with her. <laughs> Anybody have any questions? Are you guys learning a lot today? Oh, yeah. Good. Too bad they don't teach all this in school anymore. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Don't know what they do teach. <laughs> okay, we're going to, uh, what's that? I would have never guessed that New York is one of the last colonies. Right. Not the first. It was one right. of the last. Right, you're right. Yeah. yeah it's amazing. Okay, we're going to go into that uh, white uh, door. Well over a hundred gas pumps. A lot of Elvis stuff. <laughs> The big Elvis man. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's neat. Look at the cigarette machines. Mm -hmm. They'd be on the curb, like at the big cities, and uh, they'd be in front of normally like a hardware store. You go in the hardware store, you give them the 11 cents a gallon, they turn the petcock on, the holding tank would have to be higher than the gas pump because it's all gravity feed back then, and a Model T Ford would only hold eight gallons. Mm -hmm. So these are the first gas pumps commercially used in America. 
I was real lucky to get this whole collection from a guy in uh, Kansas. <laughs> okay, let me show you one of my fastest hot rods here. It's a 1941 Woolies. I have two of these. It was a 1941 Woolies, and a hot rod like this goes for around eighty to ninety thousand dollars. The Woolies company in 1941 only made these coupes for less than ninety days, three months, because in 1941 the Woolies company got an order from the U.S. government to make seventeen thousand Jeeps. In the next four years, 1941 to 45, they made two hundred and fifty thousand Jeeps for the army. Uh, MD is uh, the Woolies company. GPW is the Ford company. Uh, this is a Dark Brothers motor. If you never heard of Dark Brothers, uh, they're in Connecticut. They make racing motors. They start with a cast iron block that's uh, 565 cubic inches. They put a 671 blower on it, two four-barrel Demon carburetors, and the whole motor set up there goes for around $38,000. It's hooked up to a B&M Hydro four-speed transmission, narrowed nine-inch rear uh, with 411 gears. The tires in the back of this are 18 inches wide. Wow. This car pulls the front wheels off the ground. <laughs> Nobody beats the Dragon Man. <laughs> I'm, I'm a horsepower and torquer. 850 it horsepower. <laughs> when, when are you going to race next? Huh? Well, I take it to the car shows. Oh, the last that. car show was last Saturday night. Oh. Yeah, we have it all summer. Uh, it's on Powers Boulevard and Palmer Park in the Kmart parking lot. Yeah. Kmart went out of business like 15 oh, years ago. Yeah, because yeah, you know, Walmart's across the street. You can't beat Walmart. Okay, we're gonna, we have two more rooms like this to look at. Everybody having a good time? Got to, uh, you, know, some, you know, most of them are nice, but then I get some ATF guys. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's move down a little more. Yeah. When you get really that show cabinet straight ahead, it's got the original newspapers from around the country the day after Elvis died, August 17th, 1977. If Elvis was still alive, which he is when I put all these lights on, he'd be 85 years old. He died when he was 42 years old. He was born January 8th, 1935. He's been my idol forever. You have a question back here for someone. Did you see? Did you see Elvis? What's that? Did you see Elvis? Oh yeah, yeah. I have three of his outfits in the other room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 20 yeah, years ago, I, I paid over $4,000 for each one. Yeah, so uh, all these bicycles from 1950 to 59, here's a Columbia bicycle with a mile and a half on a speedometer. Oh wow. I get these from collectors from all around America. This is a visible gas pump, 1917. There's no motors in there. See, that's the pump. See that big arm? Mm -hmm. And you pump up the gas into 10 gallons into that cylinder and gravity feed into the Model A. You guys ever see that movie, Grease? Yes. Well, I've seen it 50 times. That's exactly the way it was in 1958 when I went to high school. Oh, super. This is the way the girls used to dress back then. She's got pairs, sunglasses, motorcycle jackets, hot pants, mini skirts, high heels. I was even afraid of them. Right? Everything was going good with all this oldies but goodie stuff until 1964. Something changed everything. Anybody know what happened? Just back then, that's why we have nothing from the Beatles. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to go out here and make a right. We're almost done. Another hour. <laughs> yeah. Just off the so, right. Did Dale ask how we're doing out here? <laughs> hey? Uh-uh. Yeah, that's him. No. <laughs> Okay, guys, this is every NVA, North Vietnamese Army's uniform. I have every one of them now. This is the way uh, 
They used to look, we used to call them gooks. They were only 12, 14, 16, 17 year old kids. They were all programmed to hate the Americans. They would never face you and fight you. It was always ambushes and booby traps. Look how small he was. You think this kid's going to fight me? I don't think so. I'd take him by the neck and throw him against the wall. <laughs> if a gook had an AK-47, it was like an American soldier having an M60 machine gun. Normally, this is what they fought with. Poison darts, poison oh arrows, goodness. crossbows, machetes. This is the way they made their shoes out of tires. Okay? Uh, we used to call them the Flintstones. You know? <laughs> Here's a picture of my mom. She was a nurse for two years in Europe. Uh, unfortunately, when she got home, she threw away all her clothes, her uniforms, but I have all her medic equipment and first aid kits. Here's a picture of Kermit. That's my dad. He was a corporal on the B-17 uh, airplanes. He was a bombardier. He got married to my mom, Edith, 1944, and I was born a year later, 1945. That makes me a World War II baby. <laughs> <laughs> Now, do I look 75 years old? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, everything on me still works, girls. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here, come around here. This is my mom and dad's memorial that they helped me set up 10 years ago before they passed away. Over here, I got the last clothes my dad was wearing when I took him to the hospital, the last clothes oh, wow. my mom was wearing, and this is exactly where they wanted to be, and that's where they are, right here. His name was Kermit. This is me when I was born. No tattoos. That? <laughs> That's me about three years old. Pretty ugly. This is all my dad's flying helmets, his honorable discharge. And this is his uh, This is his uniform in the airplane. Look how warm that looked. See, it's got leather and fur. Wow. Uh, he told me they were still freezing because the B-17s in World War II didn't have any pressurized cabins. Mm. It was 10 to 20 below zero in the airplane. Wow. Yeah, he told me all kinds of uh, stories. You have to be, have oxygen the whole time. Yeah. Uh, what do you call it? He did 13 missions. All he had to do was seven. He didn't have to go up again. And he volunteered for six more. I don't know why. I said, Dad, what were you trying to get? The Medal of Honor? You know? I said, if you got shot down, I wouldn't be here. You go, oh, I didn't think of that. <laughs> okay, let's go into the next room here. I can't believe Dale and ask how we're doing. Hey. Dale, I... Oh, it was only through text that I was oh, talking to I him. See. I wasn't actually talking to him on the phone. Oh, so. oh, Full of morphine. See, if I was in a legal museum, I couldn't have this. It's a drug. And uh, there's a needle in here. You see these a lot in the, uh, in the army movies. The guy gets shot. The medic comes over, puts yeah. that in the arm. He squeezes it. And in three minutes, it paralyzes your left or right side of your body. So morphine. Yeah. Okay, and this is what my mom said. If you got shot and a big bone, the bullet went into a big bone, like your leg bone or your hip, uh, this is the bullet remover. Oh, wow. Yeah, you never knew that, huh? Don't <laughs> <Yeah>. say? <laughs> no, thanks. See, and there's different uh, sizes for different calibers. Wow. Now, if the bullet goes in your bone, how do they know what, uh, I guess they x-ray you and see uh, what size bullet. Okay, over here. Holes there, we'll just go there. Okay, you remember, well, you guys will remember, but in 1943 to 45, uh, Lucky Strikes came out with Lucky Green Goes to War Cigarettes. That pack of cigarettes, unopened like all these are, are worth over $500 a pack. Wow. Did you guys ever hear of the Liberator handgun? Well, I have three of them now. In 1943, uh, the, uh, the Chevy company, GMC, got the contract to make one million of those throwaway guns. They were thrown out of the airplanes, uh, in this cardboard box with those instructions and eight bullets and that stick to push the shell out because it would only shoot one bullet at a time. And uh, it cost the Americans a dollar ten cents to make each gun. They're worth twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars if you could even find one. If you shoot the gun more than eight times, the whole thing falls apart in your hand like a Ford. Oh, <laughs> went all tour without mentioning the Ford. <laughs> Kidding around with the Fords because uh, <laughs> Justin just bought a brand new Ford truck. <laughs> and right on the tailgate, it says found on road 10. Uh -huh. yeah. <laughs> well, fix a repair that way. We you almost know. made a whole tour without that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I had it. Yeah. Hit the ground. Hit the ground. Look at this guy. The loop popper. Put your helmet on. Get your weapon out.
you to warn you. See what happened? This happened about a month ago to the Nazis. They see the uh, lights on. They send over the Luftwaffe. But luckily, they uh, they missed their bombing target. See, it's the Colorado Springs. There's a medal for the Manhattan Project to make the atomic bomb. See, it's dated 1943. All the bullets are dated 1939 to 45. You don't get any more realistic than this. Okay, over here, when you come through the aisle here, these are Purple Heart uniforms with a picture of a soldier that wore that uniform and got shot during World War II. I get these from widows from all around America. A lot of them want the original picture back. I just copy it and send them the original picture back. And I also have all that dog tags. Yes. We're going to go into the next room. I have 175 uniform mannequins with every uniform the U.S. government ever made. What do you think of that? Do any of you guys like the museum? Yeah. Incredible. Incredible. It's got to be one of the best in the country. Yes. If you don't think it is, let me know, because Monday's my day off. I'll buy, I'll buy more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay, follow me. I'll meet you up in the gun store. Yeah, when did they stop the notch in the dog tags? When did they quit doing the notches? When did they quit doing them? Yeah. Yeah. Um, would have been in the uh, middle to late 70s. Oh, I was in the middle of 64. Yeah. Okay, guys. Okay. If you want to talk to me, you want pictures, anything, I'll meet you.